I'm Mike Gusev. I'm a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. And today we're gonna to talk about the fundamentals of using the stream tracer injection technique. This is a fundamental technique that we can use to study the fate and transport of solutes and streams. And this will be the beginning of three videos. The other two will build on the fundamentals that we discuss here. Stream tracer experiments are only as powerful as the data that's collected from them. We add or inject tracers to stream water to label that stream water. And the goal often is to figure out how long it takes or how it moves from one point to another and potentially how it's been transformed between those two locations. In stream tracer experiments, we collect breakthrough curves of the tracer concentration downstream. These are temporal records of how that concentration changes at a defined sampling location. Stream tracer injections can be used to determine in-channel transport characteristics such as advection, dispersion, and exchange with in-channel storage zone. Advection is the bulk movement of stream tracer with the main fast flow of the stream. Dispersion occurs due to real-world differences in velocities, which causes some tracer to move ahead of the bulk flow and some of it to lag behind the bulk advection of solute. Exchange of stream water and tracer between the main flow and in-channel hydraulic dead zones like eddies, for example, further delay the downstream transport of solute, resulting in a characteristic tailing of the tracer breakthrough curve. So when we look at a reach like this, we expect hyperionic exchange or the movement of water between the channel and the subsurface to potentially move between breaks and slope. So the breaks and the slope as we move downstream are at these steps and pools. The water can infiltrate underneath and come back up to the channel. The other plan form that we have here is this meander bend and we, you can see that up by this stilling well, the water is at a much higher elevation than down here around the bend. And so the spatial shortcut would be for water to cut through the meander bend. But of course, that's going to take more time because of the tortuous path of moving through the rock matrix as opposed to coming around in the channel. In addition to quantifying in-stream transport processes, a stream tracer injection can also be used to evaluate the exchange of stream water and groundwater. One simple way to do this is to conduct an injection and look for where dilution occurs downstream. Another approach to quantifying stream groundwater exchange is to carefully track the mass balance of stream water and tracer mass passing each location compared to what was originally injected. The examples mentioned to this point have primarily focused on conservative transport of tracers like bromide, chloride, two commonly used salt tracers, or fluorescent dye as a primary tracer. However, we can also use non-conservative solutes in our tracer injections to evaluate not only the transport, but also the fate of those solutes. For example, we could inject nitrate to look at the retention of that solute in stream ecosystems. There are two general types of stream tracer injections. The first is the instantaneous slug, pulse, or gulp method in which a predetermined amount of tracer is spilled into the stream at a single location all at once. Ideally, this approach labels one parcel of water and sampling downstream, either in the stream or in hyperreic wells, will then tell us whether, how much, and when that parcel of water arrived at that location. The second method is the constant rate injection method. In this approach, one will generate a large quantity of tracer solution and inject it into the stream at a constant rate over some amount of time.
slipstream tracer injections are subject to something we call the window of detection. And that window of detection is partly spatial and partly temporal. Over some defined stream reach, we can sample through time during and after a stream tracer injection to perhaps determine how long it takes for all tracer to flush out of that reach. This time scale is dependent upon several factors such as the amount of exchange between the stream and the groundwater, but also depends on stream tracer type and which method is used. All stream tracers have some detection limit, so we are always limited by our ability to confidently detect the presence of our tracer. The method also matters because a single pulse injection of tracer should pass through a system relatively quickly compared to the constant rate injection of tracer over a long period of time. The window of detection is also influenced by how much tracer is added, that is, how high tracer concentrations get in the stream. The method of stream tracer injection you choose to use will depend on your objectives and your need for a specific window of detection. Here are a few pros and cons for each method. The pros of the pulse injection include we have a known mass that's injected, it's easy to execute, we just mix and pour, it's a fairly quick technique, and we label just a single parcel of stream water. The cons of the pulse injection method include peak concentration and timings at downstream locations can be difficult to predict. Thus, a tracer can move faster than expected and it can be difficult to keep up with reasonable sampling rates to sample the breakthrough curve adequately. In addition, the technique labels only a single parcel of stream water, which may not help you achieve your objective. Now let's talk about the pros and cons of the constant rate injection method. The pros of the constant rate injection method include tracer arrival at downstream locations is more gradual than in the instantaneous injection. Many parcels of water are labeled. A steady state profile of tracer concentration is achievable after an extended time of injection. And we can identify processes or time scales that the pulse method cannot. The cons of the constant rate injection method include it requires more equipment, pumps, batteries, etc. It requires a reservoir of tracer solution, and if your injection time scale is long enough, it may require multiple reservoirs. Ultimately, you'll have to find a way to ensure that you have the same concentration in each of these. Many parcels of water are labeled, which may or may not be advantageous to your objective. It requires more sampling than the pulse method. It is also very sensitive to changes in stream discharge, which may occur during the injection. And the total length of time of sampling can vary depending on how long it takes for all tracer to flush out of the reach. Regardless of which method you choose to use, here are a few best practices. You want to be prepared to collect a robust data set. And often we don't know what the questions about interpretation are going to be until long after the field work is complete. It's very helpful to measure stream discharge at at least one location many times during a stream tracer injection. When planning a stream tracer injection, it's important to estimate how much tracer mass you're going to need to achieve the signal you expect downstream. You can also use this spreadsheet tool to estimate the tracer concentration and injection rate required for a constant rate injection. If conducting a constant rate injection, you'll have to balance pump rates, volumes of injectate, injectate concentration to ensure that all are feasible with the equipment you have. Ideally, you want instantaneous and even mixing across the width and depth of your stream channel. To achieve this, try to inject just upstream of a turbulent constriction to promote mixing. If conducting a constant rate injection, it is best to be prepared to measure the injection rate somehow and how that may change with time. We recommend using a graduated cylinder to capture the injection flow for 15 seconds, read the volume, record both, and dump that injectate into the stream and then give your graduated cylinder a rinse. Be sure that stream sampling occurs from the Thalweg. Establish a sampling frequency across the field team. Plan to have communications across all field sites. If done well, the stream tracer injection technique should yield a robust data set that provides the information you are seeking, 
a dense data set with little uncertainty in concentration values and timing that may be used for transport modeling. Stream tracer injection methods are used to label and follow parcel or parcels of water as they move downstream. They're powerful methods that are especially useful when there's proper planning, execution, and sometimes a little bit of good luck. Two example applications of using stream tracer injection methods include using hydrogeophysics to image the exchange of stream water through the stream bed, which is video two in this series, and injecting smart tracers to study the metabolic processes in streams, which is video three in this series.